Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask those in-house to make sure cell phones have been silenced as we prepare to begin as a courtesy to our presenters. And, of course, our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Dr. Stephen Bucci. Dr. Bucci is director of our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign and National Security Policy. He served for three decades as an Army Special Forces officer and top Pentagon official, serving as we and is well versed in special operations and cybersecurity as well as defense support to civil authorities. He served as military assistant to Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld for five and a half years. Upon retirement, he continued at the Department of Defense, and prior to joining Heritage, he was a lead consultant for I to IBM on cybersecurity policy. Please join me in welcoming Steve Bucci. Steve. Well, I'd like to add my welcome to everyone, both in the room and, and joining us either through uh, TV or the Internet. Uh, this is, frankly, a huge group for a meeting in August here in Washington, D.C., so I appreciate everybody being here, and it's uh, a testimony to the people we have on the panel, but also to the subject. Uh, this is an awfully important discussion we're about to have, and, and I really hope everyone is here with an open mind. Uh, we, we tried to pick our panelists that would, uh, would really stir some thinking. Uh, we're going to give each of them about uh, 12 minutes or so to give their presentations, and then we'll spend the bulk of our time answering your questions. Uh, and I'll give you some additional instructions on, on questions when we get to that period uh, after we get their opening remarks. Uh, our title is Assessing the Iran Nuclear Agreement, Placing Sanctions in Context. All right, so the focus today is on the sanctions piece of, of this agreement and everything around it. Uh, there are a lot of issues we could get into on, on the agreement with Iran. Uh, and perhaps we will get into some of those when we get to the uh, question and answer. But again, keep in mind, sanctions is, is the focus here today. Uh, sanctions are what convinced Iran to come to the table. And unfortunately, sanctions are one of the least understood parts of not just th this agreement, but in, in international relations and in the other places we've used them. A lot of myths, a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of, of beliefs that are not necessarily based on anything than someone's uh, faith in, in the particular aspect of it. But we've got three experts here that hopefully will, uh, in their remarks and in their answers to your questions, will give us a little more understanding about the utility of sanctions and how they have played a role in this particular case. I'm going to introduce them now in the reverse order which that they will speak. Uh, they're seated correctly. Uh, so the, the first is uh, a good friend, Elon Berman. Uh, Elon is the Vice President of the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, he is an expert in the region uh, for uh, security policy. He has uh, been a uh, uh, advisor and, and consultant to uh, several parts of the U.S. intelligence community and to the Department of Defense. Uh, he is a frequent commentator on CNN and other news outlets, uh, and he is uh, a, an educator as well as an author. Uh, and uh, just a quick pitch, later in September we're going to have him here uh, to discuss his latest book, so you can ask him any questions about that if you want to, but we are going to have a separate event for that. Uh, but he is going to be our cleanup hitter on the, uh, the speaker, so he will go last. Uh, next to him, we have Dr. Emanuela Otolungi. Uh, he is the uh, works at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy. Uh, he is a uh, an, an Italian, which I like. Uh, uh, he is going to bring to, uh, to us the European perspective on some of these issues, which is frankly a little different than than the American, uh, and is useful. Sometimes here in, in Washington we forget there's, we have a bunch of allies and friends out in the world that may not see things exactly the same as we do. Uh, he has done a ton of work, several books, uh, quite a bit of, of media participation, 
dealing specifically with Iran uh, and the Middle East in general, but uh, he is a, a great addition uh, to the panel here. Uh, he has been on a contributor to an enormous amount of, of uh, news outlets all around the world, uh, so he brings that perspective. And last is uh, a one of my heritage colleagues, Bruce Klingner, uh, who is not an expert in Iran. He is an expert in North Korea. Uh, and the reason Bruce is here is to, he's going to give us a little level set on a historical case study, if you will, where we have used sanctions and done negotiations to try and stop proliferation with another country in the world, which is North Korea. Uh, Bruce uh, has spent a lot of time uh, in the government. He was an analyst for both the Central Intelligence Agency and the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, and is kind of a celebrity in South Korea. He goes over there and and gets treated like a big shot because they recognize that his knowledge and experience with their neighbor to the north uh, is pretty darned extensive and pretty relevant. So he will uh, go first, and as I say, we'll give them 10 to 12 minutes each, moving from Bruce to uh, Emanuela to uh, Ilan, and then we'll start the Q&A, and we'll give you some more instructions at that time. So with this, we'll start, Bruce, you can begin. Well, thank you, Steve. Um, I, I'm glad you said that I'm seated correctly. At least I got that right. Um, so the audience may well wonder, and rightfully so, why uh, at an event on the Iran nuclear deal you have someone uh, with no expertise in Iran or, or the Middle East. But since I have been covering North Korea for qu uh, quite some time, and there's a lot of similarities as well as differences between the negotiations between the two countries as well as the, the nuclear programs, um, they thought it might be of some utility to have me up here taking space. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is talk about five myths about sanctions, particularly as they apply to North Korea, but also uh, to Iran, uh, and then ten lessons learned from the North Korean nu nuclear negotiations, which I think are helpful to keep in mind when assessing uh, the Iran deal. I, I won't talk about the Iran deal itself. I'll, talk, uh, I'll leave that to my colleagues. So on the five myths about sanctions, the, the first would be that the U.S. and other nations face a policy choice between sanctions and engagement. It's seen as a binary choice, you do one or the other. Um, but obviously, sanctions and diplomatic engagement are most effective when they're integrated into a comprehensive, integrated strategy that includes all of the instruments of national power, including diplomatic, informational, military, uh, and economic. And no tool is to be used in isolation. Uh, not util fully utilizing any element of, of the toolbox it really reduces the effectiveness of foreign policy and really undermines the other tools. Uh, the second myth is that sanctions can't affect an isolated country, whether it's North Korea or, or others. Uh, and when people hear of sanctions, they usually think of trade sanctions, i.e. refusing to allow trade between two countries. But it also includes things like targeted financial measures, uh, which are directed against specific entities that are violating U.S. laws. And what it's doing is it exploits their need to access the global financial network. And even the most isolated regime, the most uh, you know, criminal organization or a terrorist group, they, they're tied to the global financial order. And eventually, dirty money has to cross borders. And the vast majority of all international transactions, financial transactions, uh, are denominated in dollars, which may not sound important, but every dollar denominated uh, tr financial transaction in the world must go through a U.S. Treasury Department controlled uh, and regulated bank uh, in the United States. So that means if you're transferring money from Australia to London or Macau to Pyongyang, it goes through New York. And a UN panel of experts recently uh, concluded or, or affirmed <coughs> that for North Korea, they still, the majority of their transactions still continue to be denominated in dollars. What that does is it gives the US government tremendous leverage and tremendous power. And for banks and businesses, there really are catastrophic risks to facilitating illicit transactions, even unknowingly. Uh, for example, a British bank was fined $2 billion for money laundering and sanctions violations, including financial dealings with Iran. A French bank was fined $9 billion for processing banned transactions with Iran and Sudan 
uh, in Cuba. And beyond having to pay fines or having their assets uh, frozen or seized, financial institutions can be designated as a money laundering concern and denied access to the U.S. financial system. And given the centrality of the U.S. financial system to the, to the international system, uh, that really is the kiss of death, because not only can it not access the U.S. system, it cannot uh, have sanction or uh, uh, correspondent accounts in U.S. banks, uh, but also any other entity would, would shun any contact with them. The third myth, uh, North Korea is the most heavily sanctioned country in the world. President Obama has asserted that uh, in, in interviews, and it's simply not true. Uh, Washington has targeted far fewer North Korean entities than those of the Balkans, of Burma, of Cuba, Iran, and Zimbabwe. In fact, we have twice as many Zimbabwe entities on the unilateral U.S. sanctions list as North Korean entities. Uh, and nor has uh, Washington designated North Korea as a money laundering concern as we did Iran and Burma. And while the U.S. has targeted uh, such countries as Zimbabwe, Congo, and B Burma for human rights violations and sanctioned by name the presidents of Zimbabwe and Congo, uh, to date the administration has not sanctioned a single North Korean entity for human rights violations. And this is 18 months after a U.N. commission uh, concluded that North Korea's human rights violations were so heinous as to constitute crimes against humanity. Uh, the fourth myth is that there's nothing more the U.S. can impose on North Korea. And here I'm actually very envious of the sanctions that the U.S., the EU, and U.N. imposed on Iran uh, because they're far stronger than anything on North Korea, uh, which really is seemingly counterintuitive because unlike <coughs> Iran, North Korea has withdrawn from the Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's exploded several nuclear devices, uh, and it doesn't claim it's uh, nuclear program is for civil civilian purposes, and instead they say it's to turn Washington, Tokyo, and Seoul into seas of fire. Uh, and so instead, with towards North Korea at least, the U.S. has pursued a policy of timid incrementalism uh, in which there's claims of tough measures, but really there's only uh, minimal measures after each provocation or violation or attack uh, in order to save something for the next time. Uh, and after he left office, the the as former Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, Kurt Campbell, uh, sort of surprised himself by saying uh, you know, Myanmar or Burma is sanctioned ten times as much uh, as North Korea, and it's possible for us to put more financial pressure on North Korea, and we can make their life much more difficult. Uh, the fifth and, and final myth, sanctions don't work. Well, you might want to ask the South, Korea, uh, South African apartheid regime about that. Uh, and Libya gave up its nuclear, war, uh, nuclear weapons program in, in return for sanctions relief, uh, and sanctions is what brought Iran back to the table. Uh, and as for North Korea, tougher measures did work when they were applied. In 2005, the Treasury Department sanctioned or designated a Macau-based uh, Banco Delta Asia as a money laundering concern, uh, and in conjunction with uh, private meetings by U.S. officials, uh, throughout Asia, there were over two dozen entities in China, Singapore, elsewhere, uh, that stopped doing business with North Korea at all, not only the one bank. Um, and at the time, the North Korean negotiator told a White House official, you finally found a way to hurt us. Uh, and then even though at the time, Senators uh, Clinton and Kerry and Biden all criticized the action, uh, once in office, senior Obama administration officials said, uh, the Banco Delta Asia action was very effective, and it was a mistake for the Bush administration to have removed those sanctions. Uh, and then later they said they're trying to recreate that same pressure on North Korea as existed back in 2005. Now, uh, 10 lessons that uh, I think we've learned from the North Korean negotiations that I think are useful to keep in mind when assessing the Iran deal. Uh, the first, violations make a shaky foundation for negotiations. Uh, when you think of the discussions with uh, Iran as well as with North Korea, they were precipitated by those countries' previous violations of UN resolutions and, and treaties and agreements, uh, which is hardly the basis the, for confidence that they'll be abide by yet another agreement. Uh, the second lesson would be don't do your end zone dance too early. Uh, the Clinton administration claimed in, uh, that the 1994 agreed framework uh, had solved the North Korean nuclear problem in, in language very, very similar to what President Obama has been saying 
about the Iran deal. Uh, it was later confirmed that Pyongyang had already begun a uranium-based nuclear weapons program even before it signed the agreed framework. So as it was signing it, it was already in violation, it, as well as three previous agreements to never pursue nuclear weapons. So again, not a, a strong basis for confidence. Uh, the third lesson, a bad cop is good to have. Uh, the agreed framework was not the immaculate diplomatic conception that its supporters claimed. There was a lot of talk of war with North Korea. Uh, there was discussion that the Clinton administ administration was discussing attack options uh, when they looked up from their desk to see uh, Jimmy Carter giving a CNN interview in Pyongyang announcing the, the parameters of a deal that the administration had no idea he was, he was negotiating. Um, and similarly, Israel's threats of attack uh, similarly focused Tehran's leaders on the penalties of defiance. Uh, four, even a final agreement is never final. Uh, vague text uh, allows for countries to cheat while semi-legitimately claiming compliance. Uh, and like a good defense lawyer, Pyongyang or Tehran could use ambiguity um, uh, to confuse uh, its opponents as well as to avoid punishment. Uh, and during the negotiations, or even afterwards, what we've seen is to prevent the cr uh, crisis, the collapse of the agreement, uh, or the negotiations, policymakers often become willing to negotiate away uh, previous resolutions, previous treaties, or, or simply not enforce U.S. law. Uh, the fifth would be verify, verify, verify. Uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, you know, dictum of trust but verify was reflected in what was you know, very extensively detailed uh, treaties as well as verification protocols with the Soviet Union, uh, which enabled progress, uh, you know, and, and precisely defining the verification mechanisms and responsibilities of all groups. So uh, what it requires is a very robust verification regime, including short notice challenge inspections of non-declared facilities. The sixth, Arms control advocates reject evidence of cheating. Uh, Pyongyang serially deceived, denied, and defied the international community, yet arms control proponents responded to the growing evidence of North Korean cheating by doubting, dismissing, deflecting, denouncing, deliberating, debating, dawdling, delaying, demanding, and eventually dealing. Uh, and those experts initially rejected uh, intelligence reports and other evidence uh, of North Korea's plutonium program, and they denied the uh, highly enriched uranium program, then the North Korean compliance or complicity in building a, a nuclear reactor in Syria, and right now it's debating about uh, how far along North Korea is on miniaturizing uh, its warhead. Um, seven, evidence of cheating doesn't arrive gift wrapped. Uh, after decades of debating whether Iran even had a nuclear weapons program, experts now claim Iran is precisely two months away from, from breakout, uh, and also that uh, the strong belief that U.S. intelligence will now be able to quickly and unequivocally identify cheating and then convince U.S. policymakers and U.N. representatives um, to reimpose sufficient penalties to deter Iran from a nuclear weapons breakout. Uh, you know, sort of imagine a CIA analyst, you know, running down to the White House with, you know, evidence in hand and kicking in the door, uh, sir, they're cheating, and then having a policymaker uh, respond, by God, you're right. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced by your single briefing. Uh, let me immediately trash my signature legacy foreign policy achievement and go for sanctions. Not likely. Um, number eight, the international community doesn't snap back. Uh, the UN has shown a remarkable ability to emit uh, a timid squeak of indignation when its resolutions are blatantly violated and then only after extensive negotiations and compromise. And hampered by China and the Soviet Union, or I'm sorry, Russia, uh, the UN Security Council has really been limited to a lowest common do denominator uh, response. You know, and the, and the snapback. It sort of conjures up this image of a, of a powerful rubber band that's going to give you a painful whack. Uh, but really, it's more like the reality of the international responses have been more sort of like a, a limp, deflated balloon a week after the party. It's, it's not very impressive. Uh, nine, be wary of the administration's promises to increase pressure, whether it's increase sanctions on North Korea or to firmly impose a snapback or sanctions. Um, the Obama administration has pulled its punches towards North Korea. Um, by not fully implementing U.S. law. And there's a long list of, of promises of we will 
uh, increased pressure, and, and we're still waiting on that. Um, we've seen that they, uh, uh, or Secretary Kerry has promised more pressure. I remember a couple years ago, two or three years ago, a, a U.S. official promised that we're considering even blood-curdling sanctions on North Korea. Well, we're still waiting. Uh, tenth and, and final, negotiations allow inching across red lines. Uh, alternating provocative behavior and a willingness to negotiate uh, enabled North Korea, and I'd suggest Iran as well, to manipulate the international community into timidity about imposing penalties as well as acquiescing to repeated violations. And by maintaining a strategic ambiguity for long enough on their nuclear programs, uh, Pyongyang and Tehran, like the proverbial camel's nose under the tent, are gaining international acceptance of activities that were previously declared unacceptable. And proponents of the Iran deal will dismiss criticism that it allows Tehran nuclear capabilities, which had been precluded by a series of UN resolutions. And they argue that it's unreasonable to ex expect Iran to give up capabilities that they devoted great resources as well as national pride to. Um, so if, no, to take a lesson from the Iran deal and, and reimpose it towards, or refocus it towards North Korea, uh, if nuclear negotiations were to resume with North Korea, it's clear that Pyongyang would cite the Iran precedent and demand terms far less restrictive than current UN resolutions demand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, thank you also for mentioning my nationality, because uh, it allows me to do two things. First, it allows me to keep my uh, slightly accented uh, Italian rule, and you won't uh, hold it against me. But more importantly, I do not have to uh, prove my loyalty to the commander-in-chief, uh, at least in this room. Um, <laughs> because I'm not American. Um, and as the only Ameri non-American on the panel, I certainly would like to start by making reference to Europe. Uh, I was recently in Europe, because as you know, Europeans enjoy eight weeks of holiday every summer, uh, before the winter holiday, of course. And um, I had the opportunity to speak to a number of officials there about the, the deal and uh, um, the the one uh, comment that really sort of made my day, or my eight-week holiday, um, was something that was said to me by a, um, an official of one of the ministries in Europe that shall be remained a name, but has a huge stake in uh, the success of this agreement. And that allows me to save you 10 minutes of comments. Um, he said, sanctions are toast. And uh, that is the view of the European business community for sure, supported by, by and large, their governments. The view is that the agreement is done. Um, there is a bit of a misunderstanding and confusion about why the Americans keep on discussing it and debating it uh, uh, in Congress, because fact of the matter is there is a, an agreement reached by the P5 plus one, or as the Europeans like to call it, the EU three plus three. Um, and it is not a, a trivial distinction. Um, and that agreement has now become a Chapter 7 Security Council resolution that is mandatory on all members of the United Nations, including uh, the United States, which is a founding member uh, and signatory of the Charter. So uh, whatever Congress does, uh, the weight of the international community now is behind the lifting of sanctions, provided the Iranians fulfill their obligations. That's the view. And because uh, the assumption is that within a number of months the IAEA will complete uh, its task of uh, uh, looking at uh, Iran's nuclear program and we will move fairly fast uh, uh, to implementation day, the Europeans are not waiting in the wings until that day to start discussing or indeed signing deals with the Iranians uh, in order to resort to the fruitful level of trade they had with Iran before the sanctions began. Just a reminder, in 2006, the last year before sanctions uh, were approved by the UN Security Council uh, against Iran, thus beginning 
the decade-long march uh, towards this deal. The European Union as a whole uh, had a volume of trade of 25 billion euro a year with Iran. At the time, it was about 40 billion dollars a year. Uh, today would be about 30. Uh, but the Europeans are confident that they can reach that level of, of trade again fairly quickly and then cross it. Um, it was a very comprehensive, uh, all-encompassing business relation whereby uh, Iran was relying on European technology, uh, oftentimes produced by small, family-owned, non-publicly traded enterprises. The bulk of the high-tech, uh, high-end technology produced in Germany, in Italy, in Austria is not uh, coming from uh, publicly traded uh, um, Fortune 500 uh, type companies. It is produced by small companies that have 30, 40, 50 employees uh, owned by a family of four uh, and, and, and little else. Uh, many of these companies uh, sell 80 to 90 percent of their products in the local markets, in the European market, or to Asia. Some of these companies never trade with the United States never conduct any kind of banking transactions with the United States, do not have U.S. persons on their board, do not have shareholders uh, from the United States, are not interested and are not that concerned the moment that sanctions are lifted about what is happening in Congress and what the United States may or may not do, provided they have the backing of their governments. And now this is part of the argument that the administration is making to say, look, um, look at where the world is going. Um, without a deal, the sanctions would collapse. And I would like to uh, spend a couple of minutes addressing this argument. Because the fact of the matter is that the sanctions would collapse without a deal, provided that the administration continues to follow the policy it has indeed followed uh, with regard to its own sanctions and the sanctions regime as a whole since the um, uh, negotiations began for the interim deal. Now, one more uh, myth that needs to be punctured here. Um, uh, negotiations did not begin two years ago, uh, as the administration seems to suggest frequently. Negotiations began over a decade ago. That's why the EU3 plus 3 versus P5 plus 1 is a relevant distinction. The EU3 began negotiations with Iran in late 2003. They then were joined by the United States, China, and Russia by two, June 2006. They led the negotiations headed by the EU high representative on behalf of the six powers. So the negotiations lasted for a decade. And Iran never left the table. Iran was at the table all the time. What sanctions did is that they persuaded Iran that unless it made meaningful concessions, uh, it was heading for disaster. Sanctions were extremely effective the moment that the United States and the Europeans together uh, went beyond UN sanctions and created an autonomous sanction system in bringing Iran's economy to its knees. And again, back to all of the myths that were referred to before, the notion that you can snap back sanctions. Even if there is a political will in Europe, in the United States, at the Security Council, with the P5 plus 1 and with the international community to snap back sanctions, the effect of sanctions is seen over time. The first UN Security Council resolution introducing sanctions was passed in December 2006. It was not until 2011, five years later, that the Iranians really started feeling the pressure on their economy. Now, the administration says, yes, well, maybe they were effective for a time, but this certainly did not stop Iran's uh, progress uh, on the nuclear track, so the sanctions were not stopping Iran's nuclear progress. That is true, but it's also wrong, because the sanctions were never designed to stop Iran's nuclear program. They were designed to increase the leverage of the international community over Iran. They were designed increasingly over time as 
the scope of sanctions went beyond just sanctioning or targeting entities and specific uh, individuals, but targeted sectors of the Iranian economy as a whole. They were designed to create a choice for the regime. You either make those concessions uh, and comply with your international obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or we will crush your economy, we will create such a level of dysfunction in your own country that uh, your regime will implode or crumble or be toppled by popular insurrection uh, with people hungry and upset at the way things are. And what's amazing is that this rationale, which was well understood in Europe and was certainly well understood in Congress, is a rationale that the administration all along, ever since 2009, only reluctantly embraced, uh, sometimes because it was shoved down its throat. I mean, remember that in 2009, when the regime was on the brink of collapse, with popular protests in the street, three million people in Tehran protesting against fraudulent elections, this administration chose not to support the protesters. And why did it choose so? Because it wanted to engage the regime. It wanted to basically come to an agreement with the regime. It was signaling to the regime, we really are happy with you there, as long as we can find some sort of understanding. So it's hard for an administration that sees Iran as a legitimate, the, 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 the Islamic Republic of Iran, as a legitimate interlocutor and a regime that we can work with, it is hard for an administration that sees it this way to actually embrace wholeheartedly and promote aggressively a sanctions regime that is designed to cripple this regime and bring it down if needed. So that's the first problem. Now, when the regime was crippled enough to conclude that it had to make concessions, this is where the problems begin and where really now we are in a situation where if there is no deal, uh, the deal is removed and the fault of the failure is perceived to be the United States, then the sanctions regime will be in deep trouble. The problem is that from the moment that the United States began the secret channel with the Iranians and further uh, down the road it signed an interim deal with the Iranian regime. It provided two key points to the Iranians that undermined the sanctions. One was sanctions relief. Too premature, too broad, uh, and uh, with too many extensions. And in addition to that, it only uh, very, in a very lukewarm fashion agreed to enforce existing sanctions. Many pieces of evidence for that, just one for you to take home. Look at how many entities, subsidiaries of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, the Department of Treasury and the Department of State designated after November 2013. Zero. Now, the IRGC did not benefit from sanctions relief. The IRGC is supposedly not going to benefit from the lifting of sanctions under the deal. But none of their entities has been designated since November 2013, which means that hundreds of companies controlled or owned by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards never made it to OFAC's SDN list. So companies out there in Europe, in Asia, who are now going to find interlocutors and business partners in Tehran to conduct legitimate business in all things economic that will not promote terrorism but just build bridges and hospitals, who are they going to work with in Iran? My take uh, is that they will work with a lot of IRGC companies that haven't been designated. Had Treasury and the State Department and the administration as a whole decided to negotiate, but at the same time, aggressively continue to enforce those sanctions that remained in the law books, the message would have been different. Not just to the Iranians, by the way, but to the business community outside the United States. And here, I want to give you one more example, which um, was scooped by the Wall Street Journal yesterday. The Italians, 
maybe you will hold this against me uh, at the end of it, uh, as everybody else in Europe, sent a, a very high-profile delegation to Tehran right after the signature of the deal. To, you know, to their partial credit, they let the French and the Germans go first. Um, but they went, they were the third one uh, uh, in line, they, they went last week. The foreign minister was there, the minister, um, one of the ministers uh, for the economy was there. There was a huge high-level delegation of uh, business leaders. They signed all sorts of mem memorandums of understandings and agreement. One agreement that was signed is a contract worth 500 million euro, about 557 million dollars at current exchange, between Finmeccanica, one of the biggest uh, 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 publicly traded companies in the country, it has also an office here in Washington, uh, one of its subsidiaries actually, and um, a company called Gadir Investment. Gadir Investment, according to Treasury, is slated to be delisted on implementation day in six months' time, but the Italians didn't wait six months to sign that contract. Gadir Investment is a subsidiary, according to Treasury at least, of ACO, otherwise known as CETAD, otherwise known as the business empire of the Supreme Leader. So, there is an agreement, we are waiting for implementation day, we're waiting for the IAA to do its job, where the sanctions are all still on the table, they're in the law books, we are, you know, keeping them uh, as a tool, we're ready to snap them back, we will treat violations very seriously, but lo and behold, a subsidiary of a very prominent European company feels entirely safe to go to Tehran two weeks after the deal has been announced and sign a half a billion euro deal with a subsidiary of the empire of the supreme leader. And this is just going to be the beginning. It's going to be a flood of such deals precisely because the Iranians for so many years didn't have enough money to do all of these contracts and to invest in the economy, now the lion's share of the pie will go to those elements of the regime that are, you know, in a, in a privileged position to get the contracts. And it will be the supreme leaders, and it will be the IRGC. And we know what these players in the regime will do once they reap the benefits of these very legitimate contracts, building schools and hospitals and bridges and, and so on and so forth. They will use those resources to advance their foreign policy goals, which in the region are not exactly benign. So that's uh, uh, the, the, the big problem with, uh, with the sanctions. Had the administration taken a much more aggressive, determined, principled, uh, proactive approach in enforcing those sanctions that remained in the law books during the interim period, without giving any discounts to the Iranians without fearing that any single action by Treasury, the State Department, the Department of Commerce might upset enough the Iranians that they would walk away, then the message would have been a different one to the business community. The message would have been, yes, we are negotiating. Yes, we might have a deal. Yes, there will be a deal. But don't you dare cross these lines because this is what's going to happen. Instead, the examples that were given and the precedents that therefore were set were in the opposite direction. The message was, yes, the sanctions are still in the law books, but we're really not going to implement them, which is why companies feel today comfortable that even though they're still five, six months until implementation day, they can already uh, you know, go through the breach uh, and, 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 and get the deals. The Swiss parliament, by the way, feels the same way. Now, Switzerland may be not the biggest uh, global player, but it had a very fruitful bilateral trade relation with Iran. Being uh, such an important banking hub, uh, Switzerland is important to the Iranian economy. A lot of the uh, front companies that the Iranians were running to circumvent oil sanctions, procurement sanctions, technology sanctions went through Switzerland. The Swiss parliament this morning lifted all of its sanctions. They abolished them. They're not waiting for Congress. They're not waiting for the implementation day. So in other words, even if you can treat the sanctions as a yellow light, not a red light anymore, they're a yellow light, it is not the yellow light that comes before the traffic light turns red, it's the yellow light that in some countries comes up before the traffic light turns, turns green. So 
if you come from a country like mine, where traffic lights are just a recommendation and not um, a command, when you see the yellow light, you hit the gas and, and you, you move forward. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Heritage for having me. Uh, I don't have any pithy uh, driving tips, so um, let me sort of uh, try to tackle uh, some of the th stuff that we talked around so far. Uh, and really, I want to focus on three things. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, the effects or the processes relating to sanctions lifting or sanctions implementation with regard to Iran. But, but let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, there's really three things that we should be thinking about when we think about san the sanctions uh, basket of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as the new agreement is called. First of all, where will it come from? Right? There's a myth that says that the, this is a gift from the American taxpayer. It's not. It is money that Iran generated from the foreign sales of oil to key consumers, uh, China, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, India, others. These were countries that were targeted and have been in earnest targeted since 2010 at least. I would argue long before, but uh, in a comprehensive fashion since the passage of a piece of legislation called Sasada in uh, 2010, uh, which mandated that all of these countries begin to scale back their uh, purchases of Iranian oil to essentially show a good faith effort that they were trying to wean themselves off of dependency on Iranian energy. The one-two punch of this legislative approach was that in addition to trying to compel Iranian consumers from, uh, to compel them to reduce their uh, consumption of Iranian oil, we also escrowed, froze, made inaccessible revenue that was generated uh, in the interim. So when you see uh, an, the Iranian uh, economic effects uh, that brought the regime to the table in the first place, a great deal of it had to do with the fact that much of the oil that they were selling, they couldn't receive the material benefit from. So these sanctions are not taxpayer dollars, but they are still uh, very important because they provide an aggregate expansion of the Iranian economy. And that's really the second question. Uh, how big is it? What, what are we talking about here? And, and here, I think, uh, in the debate in Washington, like in most things, there's an awful lot of heat but not a lot of light. Mm -hmm. President Obama himself has said publicly in speeches that the sanctions relief that Iran can expect to get is going to be anywhere from 140 to $160 billion. The U.S. Treasury Department has, been, uh, has had a more uh, modest estimate. Uh, they estimate uh, a little bit less than uh, $60, 000, uh, $60 billion. Um, either way, what you're looking at is an unprecedented scope of sanctions relief. And I think, you know, it's always nice to sort of go right in the middle. So let's say $100 billion or more of sanctions relief to Iran. Um, this is so large a figure that I think it's actually very unhelpful because it, for ordinary Americans, it's very hard to sort of put in context. What does that actually mean? So let me explain to you sort of in comparative terms what this looks like. In 2014, last year, uh, the Iranian annual gross domestic product was $415 billion. So what you're looking at is a sanctions package that's heading in the direction of the Islamic Republic sometime in the next six to eight months or so that is worth roughly a quarter of the Iranian economy again. In comparative metrics, this is larger than the entire Marshall Plan for the reconstruction of Europe that the Truman administration uh, initiated and then administered from 1948 to 1952. That plan, which was known as the European Recovery Program, formally, uh, was $13 billion in 1948 dollars. Uh, today's equivalent, $120 billion. It was targeted not at one country, but at 17 countries, and it spanned four years. And by the way, as long vacation times in Europe now demonstrate, it was remarkably successful in reinvigorating European quality of life and reinvigorating European economies. So that impact should not be understated. What you're looking at is a Marshall Plan for the Islamic Republic that is going to be applied in a very rapid, in, in sort of a fast-forward fashion, in a way that's likely to have tremendous salutary effects for everything relating to the Iranian economy, including both its domestic reconstruction and also its ability to uh, engage in foreign adventurism. The second comparison, which you've heard, uh, I, I think, a little bit uh, 
of late with regard to this sanctions relief package is its comparison to the U.S. economy. So uh, the most recent estimates is that in the second quarter of 2015, uh, U.S. annual GDP was uh, roughly uh, $14.7 trillion, something like that. Um, so what you're essentially looking at is, uh, and if somebody gave us the same, uh, an economic gift of the same scope, of the same size, it would be almost $4.5 trillion, right? You're looking at five times the stimulus package that followed the 2008 global uh, economic crisis, right? Now think about what the United States could do with this kind of financial windfall, and you'll have a very good appreciation of, in comparative terms, how this is being perceived in Tehran. Um, and that gets us to the third question. How is it being perceived? What, what is it going to be used for? The Obama administration has expressed its hopes that Iran is going to use these funds for uh, domestic reconstruction, it's essentially as, as a real Marshall Plan, uh, for domestic reconstruction, for infrastructure, for economic stabilization. Um, there's two possibilities here. Either it will or it won't. Uh, so let, let's assume that it will. Uh, and here, I think, an uh, example from US, recent U.S. legislative history gives us a good sense of what this looks like. Um, in 1991, Congress passed something known as the Comprehensive Threat Reduction Act of 1991. Right? This was known far, far more popularly as Nunn Luger. Right? This, is, this was the program that is still ongoing in parts, uh, started it with the collapse of the Soviet Union to help dismantle the Soviet Union's strategic arsenal, right? A very well-intentioned program. It started with a uh, sort of a initial infusion of $400 million. It's now grown to about $1.4 billion annually, right? So sort of just figure it out over time. We've sunk a lot of money into uh, helping the Russians dismantle and transition their strategic arsenal. But... Has it actually accelerated that pace? And there was a series of investigations that were done in the mid to late 1990s by magazines like Reader's Digest about what the actual ground level impact of Nunn Luger was. And the premise that Congress and the Clinton administration at the time was going for was that if, if Russia had more money to dismantle missiles, to, dis, uh, sort of to, to uh, make its stockpile more manageable, it would do so more quickly. What we found was that, that nothing of the sort happened. The Russians allocated a set percentage of their defense budget to dismantlement, and they didn't care where that money came from. And if that money, that 10%, 15%, whatever the magic number was, came from the United States, it freed up capital for them to use on other things. So uh, there's a great article, for those of you that are interested in, in looking it up, uh, from, uh, I believe, 1998 in Reader's Digest about how U.S. taxpayer dollars helped restart the Russian bioweapons effort for precisely this reason, because the Russians didn't widen the pie for dismantlement. They use this money, because money is fungible, for other things. And I think there's a very real danger of that uh, happening today. It is possible, like the administration says, that we're uh, going to see the Iranians use uh, some of the sanctions relief for domestic reconstruction. But this is an awful lot of money, and money is fungible. And it's at least as likely, if not more so, that it uses it either on that and other things, or strictly on uh, two key regime priorities. And here's where I think we really enter the zone of danger. Um, the, I, it's useful to remember, right? So uh, the Reagan administration formally listed uh, Iran as the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism uh, in 1984. And it's held that position ever since. Uh, and in the last several years, it has maintained that position despite an increasing, uh, sort of a, a series of sanctions of increasing severity. Um, back in 2007, uh, Stuart Levy, who was the Treasury Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence at the time, said that Iran maintained what he called a nine-digit line item in its budget for the support of terrorism. Right? The numbers aren't completely transparent, but we know that Iran spends uh, somewhere on the order of $200 million a year to support Hezbollah. It, spends, uh, it perhaps spends as much as uh, $25 million monthly on Hamas. Uh, it uh, funds the entire annual budget of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. It provides, according to government estimates, $6 billion a year currently to stabilize the regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria, right? So you start tallying the numbers, pretty soon it gets to be real dollars, real cents. This is a real expenditure. And it's also one that, as a result of sanctions relief, is likely to grow exponentially. Iran will have more capital 
to do the same things that it is committed to doing already, even when it's sanction constrained. And this gets us to, uh, I think, Iran's regional ambitions, because I think it's worth noting uh, that while, even as the EU 3 plus 3, right, or the P5 plus 1, or whatever you want, whatever term of art you want to use, even as we were busy negotiating the nuclear deal with Iran, what you saw was a rising trend of Iranian adventurism in the Middle East, in places like Syria, in places like Yemen, uh, in places like Bahrain, uh, in places like southern Lebanon. So what you saw was an Iran that was more and more willing to not only think globally, but act globally. Uh, the Iranians have mapped out an ambitious global agenda to promote its ideals, to ex what they call export its revolution, um, and to do so not only in its immediate periphery, but increasingly far abroad. As part of that effort, the Iranians have built a rather significant alliance system with some of the world's most troubling regimes. Um, in the Middle East, there's Syria. The, there's Iranian aid, which helped the overthrow of the uh, al-Hadi government in Yemen. Um, Iran's aid to Hezbollah and Hamas has expanded the threat uh, to Israel and to the region posed by both movements. In Latin America, you see an Iran that's increasingly in league with uh, the regime of, uh, former regime of uh, Hugo Chavez, now the regime of Nicolas Maduro uh, in Venezuela, as well as the regime of Evo, uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, of Rafael Correa in Ecuador, and an Iran that as part of that is, has insinuated itself into the region's premier anti-American geopolitical bloc, which is known as the Bolivarian Alliance for the Americas. In Africa, you see an Iran that's become a key sponsor for the uh, regime of Omar al-Bashir uh, in the Sudan. You see a Iran that is bankrolling the modernization of the Zimbabwean military. In Asia, you see an Iran that is deepening its strategic partnership with North Korea on ballistic missiles and nuclear cooperation. Right? So you see all of these rather troublesome strategic partners that Iran has aligned. And it, I think, is not a very large leap of imagination to assume that an Iran that is no longer part of the conversation, but has become the conversation because of the scope of sanctions relief that it's about to receive, is likely to, be, to transform from being a partner to becoming a patron of at least some of these regimes. And what you are heading towards as a result is an international system that is far more inimical to the interests of the United States and American allies in these respective regions. So I think this gets us to one of the reasons, uh, probably the main reason why uh, I am skeptical about the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Because to me, the watchword of diplomacy, just like the watchword of medicine, has to be to do no harm. You should not engage in diplomacy that leaves you and your national interests adversely affected, more adversely affected than you were beforehand. But the JCPOA violates that principle, and it does so in a way that is going to affect our security and the security of our allies significantly in the years ahead. So I'll stop there. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, we have about 35 minutes left. Let me give you some quick ground rules because we've got a ton of people in here, and I'm already getting questions from some of the folks who are online. I'd like you to raise your hand. I will acknowledge you. Stand up, wait till my colleague gives you the, the microphone, uh, and then tell me who you are and ask a question. All right? Please, no speeches from the floor. All right, we don't, we got too many folks. We're going to have a lot of questions. I'll give you two sentences. If I don't hear a question mark at the end of the second sentence, I'm going to ask you to sit down. Okay, we're ready. Who has the first question? All right, Jim, over there. I'm Jim Phillips here at uh, Heritage, a Senior Research Fellow, Middle East Affairs. And to me, one of the most inexplicable aspects of the sanctions relief that the administration agreed to is not, uh, totally outside the framework of nuclear sanctions in the area of ballistic missile, missile sanctions and the arms embargo. And this is particularly uh, inexplicable to me. Uh, Because the administration uh, uh, accepted the Iranian argument that 
I don't think it's you. It accepted the Iranian argument that ballistic missiles shouldn't be included as part of the nuclear negotiations because they were not uh, uh, necessarily uh, related to that, but yet they agreed to lift ballistic missile sanctions uh, after uh, uh, I think it's, uh, five years or, or eight years for the arms embargo. Uh, and I asked the uh, panel to comment on the, this aspect, which the administration itself said shouldn't be part of the negotiations, but nevertheless rewarded Iran on it. Okay. Whoever would like to go first. I, happy to go first. Uh, I think uh, um, the, the technical answer is, well, these embargoes were part of the UN Security Council resolutions that were really addressing the, um, the, the non-proliferation agenda of the Security Council, and that's why uh, they had to be addressed. I think that that's, that's not an answer because you, know, you can write anything you want in a UN Security Council resolution provided you have consensus, and um, they could have kept the arms embargo and the, and the uh, ballistic missile uh, embargo. I think that the underlying assumption here is that the nuclear deal will unlock relations between Iran and the West by empowering those inside the regime who understand that Iran has to change in order to remain you know, a player uh, in, in the international community. And therefore, the details of the deal, though important, are less critical than the deal itself. So we can make these concessions because, yes, you know, it's a gamble, but in five years' time, when the Iranians uh, are so busy reaping the benefits of this economic uh, windfall, uh, which will require them to open up and we'll get all of these, you know, vacationing Italians to come to Tehran, um, <laughs> Will, um, will be more reasonable. And once they're more reasonable, they can have their arms. And once they're even more reasonable three years later, we can let them have their missiles. Now, I think that the bottom line here has to be we need to have a discussion about how a regime that has been defiant, that has not changed uh, uh, an iota of its behavior and practices, that has actually become more aggressive as a result of, and more assertive as a result of this deal, is suddenly going to say, oh, we preserved our national pride, we preserved our assets, we cheated the international system and got rewarded for it, so now we're going to change course? So that's, I think that's the problem with the assumption. Uh, just to second that, I think that's absolutely right. And, and it deals not only with the, um, lifting of restrictions on ballistic missiles, but also the assorted non-nuclear sanctions relief that Iran is going to get, including the delisting of people like uh, terrorist mastermind Qasem Soleimani from the SDN list uh, that the government maintains. Um, I, I think what you're looking at here is uh, that the administration is saying one thing, but it's acting a different way. It says that the deal is transactional. This deal is just with the nuclear program. But it's clear from the sanctions relief, from the way the White House is talking and, and positioning the deal in the national debate, that this is intended to be transformational. This is intended to fundamentally reset uh, our relationship with Iran, Iran's relations with the West, and then, as Emmanuel said, all good things will flow. Um, I think that's uh, speculative. I think that's hopeful. Uh, I would point out that hope is not a foreign policy. Um, and I think it's much more useful to understand that the threat potential of Iran as a result of the various provisions of the JCPOA, including the exclusion of ballistic missile development, um, is not diminished. It's slowed, but it's not diminished. Um, and here, here's an interesting little vignette, which I, I actually think that the, the JCPOA is having interesting ripple effects sort of throughout Europe and throughout uh, the international community. I think it took the Russians seven and a half hours after the announcement of the JCPOA signing on July 14th to argue that now that the Iran threat has been dealt with, uh, there's no need for missile defenses in Europe. Um, that, uh, obviously that hasn't flown, or at least it hasn't <coughs> flown yet. 
uh, as a <coughs> persuasive argument, but one of the reasons it hasn't flown, as the Russians are discovering, is because they helped facilitate the exclusion of Iran's ballistic missile portfolio from the scope of the negotiations. Uh, the Iranians insisted this was a, an unacceptable demand to put on the table. Uh, we caved. The Russians uh, assisted us caving. And now the Russians are discovering that the one thing they care a lot more about, which is the sort of the ability of Europe to hold it, their strategic arsenal at risk, is not going to alter in their favor as a result of this deal. So my sense is that uh, there are different permutations of how favorable this deal is, um, certainly for the Iranians, very favorable. I think some of Iran's international partners, in which, uh, in which category I put Russia as well as China, I think they're finding it may over time be less favorable. Okay, another question. We'll get the gentleman in the back and then you, ma'am. Oh, that one. So my name's Sam Butcher. I work across the street from Congress. And as you know, all the focus on the Hill right now is about the, the disapproval vote under the Corker Bill. Um, I'm interested in what power we still have in Congress over what portion of the sanctions regime, which, as you know, is, is arguably the most complex sanctions regime probably ever we've had over the state. Um, I've counted 17 executive orders and about four dozen uh, provisions, major legislation every couple of years since at least 1990. Some of those are for nonproliferation, some are for human rights, some are for terrorism, some are unilateral by the U.S. only, some are multilateral with the U.N. Some have a presidential waiver, some don't. Just love to hear your thoughts on uh, what portion of that does Congress have control over, especially um, how that interfaces with the Corker uh, legislation regardless of how the disapproval vote goes. Yeah, I, I think Emmanuel and I have uh, somewhat different uh, views, but, uh, so, well, so my sense is that there's a couple things to unpack here. First of all, um, I think the, the way the White House ha has talked about this deal, it has made it appear as if it's a binary choice. If Congress uh, decides to disapprove of the deal and then to veto the override, uh, this is a path to war. Um, right? This is sort of how Secretary Kerry has talked about it, how the President talked about it last week uh, in his speech at American University. I think that's a straw man argument because obviously nobody wants war. But I think it's worth noting that everything that I talked about uh, with regard to the salutary benefits of uh, economic revenue flowing to Iran from the sanctions relief is prospective. It hasn't happened yet. It doesn't happen until implementation day uh, or thereafter. Right? So. Um, so what you're looking at is an Iran that is still sanctions constrained. Yes, you have serious problems. You have serious cracks in the international consensus over Iran's isolation. But remember that what we're looking at is an Iran that still, for the moment, has diminished purchasing power. So the idea that Iran sort of loose, looses all the shackles and makes a sprint towards the nuclear capability presumes an Iranian economic robustness, frankly, that isn't visible, at least not visible yet. So there's a lot that you can do, and there's very many reasons to expect that the day after a veto looks an awful lot like today does, in which you know the Iranians do not get the benefits of the JCPOA. There's a second point here, which is that uh, when we look at sanctions, you have to understand that sanctions are qualitatively different as passed here in Congress than they are in Europe. Here in Congress, they're far more complex. They deal not only with the nuclear and proliferation portfolios, but they deal with terrorism and human rights uh, issues with uh, regard to Iran. Uh, the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Accountability and Divestment Act of 2010, which I mentioned, uh, is best drawn as a kitchen sink in which sort of all these things go, right? The nuclear issue is the most important, but it's not the only one. And here I think Congress uh, has, a, uh, has a lot of incentive to refocus, if this deal does go through, on the other legs of the stool on which our regime of pressure on Iran, our legislative regime of pressure, um, actually rests. Uh, there is, of course, a hang-up because as part of the terms of the JCPOA, uh, the administration has committed itself to preventing ancillary forms of pressure that will make the deal harder to implement, which all of us, and maybe all of you, uh, have read as uh, the administration working actively against the application of additional sanctions. Um, that may be true, that may not be true, uh, we'll have to see. But my sense is that for Congress, this is a, a gut check moment, uh, obviously, for in terms of congressional priorities and constitutional prerogatives. But it's also a gut check moment in terms of how robust 
Congress's commitment is not only to the nuclear sanctions, but also to these other modes of pressure that we have and are still available to us to change Iranian behavior. Well, I, I cannot disagree, certainly. I, I do take a slightly more skeptical view of the effectiveness of, uh, of a congressional uh, uh, disapproval and veto override on, on the deal itself, uh, because I, I believe, and I've, I've certainly been told, uh, in Europe, that uh, you know the rest of the international community will you know will not agree to go and rego renegotiate the deal. Um, but I think that the um, the broader question here is um, whether Congress challenges the president or or not. Um, what how the administration addresses those sanctions that remain on, in the law books in the next sixteen months. Um, that, that, that to me is the real question, because if past this prologue, I think that regardless of what Congress does, the administration will do its utmost not to fault the Iranians uh, uh, for any violation of sanctions until January 20th, 2017. So the big question, uh, which is, I think, relevant especially uh, uh, to you and to, and to, to the, the good work you do every day, is what happens with the next administration, given that the, this administration is saying tons of norms and regulations punishing and restricting Iranian economic activities still remain in the law books. So the next administration may, may feel less committed to giving the Iranians a pass, even if Congress approves the deal in the end. And you still have a very long array of, of, of uh, uh, weapons and tools in the sanction basket that you can use and you can ask the administration to enact, and, and, and that's one. The second thing is that when you go through the measures and the entities that are going to be delisted on implementation day, on transition day, what you discover is there, there is a lot of inconsistency in the way these entities have been chosen. I want to give you one example. It may not be the, the, the sexiest one, but I think uh, 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 it speaks to the problem. Uh, between 2011 and 2013, the United States uh, uh, sanctioned, through Treasury, five Iranian airlines. Aban Air, Iran Air, Iran Air Tours, Mahan Air, and Yas Air. Three of these entities were sanctioned under Executive Order 13382, the one that deals with non-proliferation. Two of them were sanctioned by Executive Order 13224, which is the executive order that deals with uh, financial support for terrorism. When you read the motivation for the designations of the five airlines, all five were involved in a variety of activities which included ferrying weaponry and military personnel to and from Syria and giving aid and support to the IRGC. So even though three of these five airlines uh, also had some activity linked to non-proliferation, all five were supporting the Syria war effort and the IRGC. Now, by the administration rhetoric, one would assume that all five therefore remain under sanctions. Actually, three of them, the three sanctioned under 13382, are being removed. So one thing that Congress can do is raise these probing questions and ask why entities and companies that have been supporting and are presumed to be continuing to support the IRGC uh, in the supply of weapons to terror organizations, to the Syrian uh, regime, violations of human rights, uh, human uh, uh, you know, war crimes, and so on, are going to be getting sanctions relief on implementation day. You can go through these things uh, and find a lot of such examples. And I think that would be a very useful way to keep the administration's feet to the fire until, in 2017, we know whether the next administration will feel as committed or less committed to this deal. Okay. Bruce, you have anything to add to that? No? Okay. All right, uh, we're going to get this lady right here, and then I'm going to ask one from our online listeners. <clears throat> 
the first thing Iran did with its money was sign a deal for refueling aircraft, which was serendipitous for the Russians because they have an airplane and they couldn't keep the production lines open because they didn't have any money. Now they have money. Yesterday, there were Russian warships uh, having war games, more games than war. Are we seeing the beginning of uh, Russia getting its warm water port and Russia making a move into the Persian Gulf that could ultimately affect the United States and Iran would be the other side of that? No, I, I think that's a good question, and, and it's certainly a plausible one in the sense that what we've seen over the last year and a half has been a uh, Russian foreign policy that is animated by precisely this type of sort of risk-taking, this type of brinksmanship. This is uh, ever since February of 2014 when Vladimir Putin went into Ukraine. Um, what you're looking at is a Russia that's attempting to revise the established rules of the road, whether it's in Eastern Europe or now sort of uh, more so in the Persian Gulf. Um, I, I think what you're looking at, though, is uh, both. Uh, one of the, I believe, main misconceptions that we have with regard to Russia is that Putin has a desired end state. Um, everything that you've seen in Ukraine suggests actually that's not true, that Putin is uh, engaging in an opportunistic policy, that his uh, gradual escalation of uh, Russian uh, asymmetric presence, of Russian activities in Ukraine, is calibrated in response to NATO action, or lack thereof. So my sense is that everything, uh, this is, I think, probably a very good framework to apply to what Russia is doing in the Middle East. Russia has big ambitions. It has big ambitions to supplant the United States as uh, sort of the, the go-to arms supplier in the Middle East. It has, uh, it has already uh, assumed pride of place as the core nuclear supplier for the Middle East. This is sort of one of the lesser known facts that Russia is the world's leading exporter of nuclear technology. And so uh, the Iran deal, from a commercial sense, uh, looks an awful lot like a showroom for the Russians. Um, but uh, I think what you're looking at may be less a dis sort of long-term definitive strategy as a uh, Russian regime which is pushing on the door trying to exploit potential opportunities. Um, the, plenty of them in the Middle East now, as the United States appears to retract over the horizon, uh, has less and less equities. We're seeing in Iran today what we saw six, eight, 12 months ago with regard to Russian engagement with Egypt, for example. Um, this is not because Russia has such an enduring stake in Egypt, or now in Iran. Uh, it is because uh, there is a Russian saying that an empty place shall not remain empty for long, a sacred place. So, uh, and this is, I think, what you're seeing in the Middle East. Okay, this, <coughs> excuse me, is a question that came in from one of our viewers. Uh, I'm going to ask it a little differently. And, Ilan, you've already started to touch on it in one of your previous uh, responses. But is the president's construct of it's either this deal or war, is that a valid construct in, in this case? And you get to go last because you already no, started to answer it. And, Bruce, I do want you to answer that one, too based on, on experience with North Korea? Yeah, I, I, I just see a logical disconnect on, it, on the front end if it's premised as it's this deal or war. And then sort of at the tail end when the question is, is raised of, okay, what happens if Iran cheats? One would think, well, then if the deal has fallen through, then you're going to war. Your snapback is sort of on automatic military operations. But instead, the, the construct is then, well, no, we, we snap back on sanctions. So sort of on the front end, there are only two options, but on the, the tail end, it's said that there are three options, including sanctions. Now, uh, as Alana has pointed out and others, that sort of if sanctions are toast, then what your, snap, your threat of snapping back is pretty weak. But it does seem if the, uh, the, the result is a reimposition of sanctions, that that means you have three options in the beginning. You could have been continuing this to try to get a, a stronger uh, agreement. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, the, the administration certainly has so weakened and undermined its alternative policy tools that uh, it, it, uh, it, it kind of seems that it has it basically set up the stage uh, for saying, well, you know, the sanctions don't work anymore because we have trashed them. And uh, uh, the military option uh, is not credible anymore because, well, you know, we drew red lines on Syria and then you know, went to play golf. And so there's nothing left and therefore take, take it or leave it. Um, I, find, I find it very peculiar uh, that the administration should make that argument.
because the administration at the same time tells us that the Iranians are two months away, were two months away uh, from breakout uh, and would dash the bomb if uh, the deal collapsed, uh, but it just signed up to a deal that proclaims extensively and explicitly and in flowery language that the Iranians never wanted and never will pursue a nuclear weapon. So, you know, you could even say, well, since the deal says that the Iranians don't want a weapon and never pursued one, um, why do you need a deal at all? You just sort of you know, shake hands and go home. Um, what I think is that if, if the deal uh, were to collapse or if uh, a disapproval, a vote of disapproval with veto override were taken uh, as, a, as a denunciation of the deal and the Iranians said, well, we're not uh, uh, committed to it anymore, you, you're not going to have war. Uh, just like you're not going to have war if the Iranians uh, cheat egregiously and you, you, you walk to a snapback and the snapback is miraculously approved. Uh, what I think you will see is a number of much less severe, much less grave uh, intermediate options. The Iranians, for example, could respond by, to, to a vote of disapproval by saying the Americans are in violation of a UN Security Council resolution and they could file a complaint and they will play victim. Um, um, you will see a lot of other much less severe responses. And by the way, one of the arguments that the administration makes alongside its European allies to uh, justify the eff and, 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 and proclaim the effectiveness of the snapback is that if there is a political will and a recognized set of violations by the Iranians, it will be fairly easy to snap back sanctions. So you can't say, I have this tool, the snap back, and it's fairly easy to snap back if there is agreement and the mechanism protects the majority from Russian and Chinese interference and this and that and the other, but then say the only alternative to this deal is war. No. The alternative is that if there is a violation, if there is a, you know, a set of, uh, of uh, behaviors that are uh, you know, violating the deal, or if the American uh, of the U.S. Congress or the American the U.S. administration decide to uh, relist entities on uh, different accounts for Syria or human rights violation or other reasons, terrorism, and the Iranians scream and shout and protest, you're not going to war. You are. You have a whole arsenal of other policy choices, and to suggest otherwise is disingenuous. And if the administration continues to defend its deal and its foreign policy with disingenuous arguments and sound bites, what does that tell about how good this deal is? Right. So just, just two seconds, because I, I answered this already. I, I do think it's a straw man argument. I think there's plenty of other options, although, as Emmanuel said, uh, we have far fewer uh, optimal options than we did before because of the administration's uh, cog conscious and cognizant walking away from the sanctions regime and sort of divesting itself of a military, credible military option and other things. I would actually point out, uh, what Emmanuel said was actually, I think, very important because we're here in Washington and sort of, you know, across the street is where the numbers are going to be crunched. But I think, you know, if you look at the electoral math, you... Uh, uh, and you sort of look at it objectively, there is some doubt that there will be a veto. Uh, it's not a slam dunk. Uh, we don't like to use those words anymore, but it's not a slam dunk. And I, I think there's some skepticism that this deal or something very similar to it won't actually become the law of the land, at least temporarily. And this actually is, I, I think, an important inflection point for folks who work in Congress, because one of the things the administration talks a lot about is what the deal contains they don't talk a lot about what the deal does. For example, what are the on-the-ground effects in the Middle East of an Iran that's infused with this kind of capital that I talked about in my presentation? So on and so forth. Uh, what does it do to global proliferation dynamics? You can sort of begin to list a sort of a, a very significant and compelling uh, order of battle about issues that are likely to be affected once or if the JCPOA kicks in. And one thing that there's really not a lot of talk uh, about now, but there should be, is how do we manage the consequences? Are our institutions uh, in the U.S. government, whether in the executive branch or in the legislative branch, uh, are our institutions really keyed in to being able to respond effectively to additional Iranian infusions of cash to global terrorist, uh, cash to global terrorist groups? 
are we properly monitoring proliferation dynamics coming out of Asia, coming out of the Middle East? These are all serious questions, and they're qu uh, questions that can be the basis of new legislation or sort of new uh, orders of battle for different uh, governmental agencies. But this is the dog that is embarking. Uh, we are uh, in the process of deliberating a deal which, if it goes through, will put into play a series of very significant trend lines in the Middle East and far beyond that are likely to affect American security. So we should be thinking, even as we think about whether or not to pass the deal, we should be thinking about what we do if the deal passes, how do we manage the consequences. Okay. So anybody over here? I haven't got anybody on this side yet. No? no? Other questions? All right. I've got a wrap-up <coughs> question for all of you. Uh, you are, are each now sitting as the, the new national security advisor to the, the President of the United States today and the President of the United States in 2017, January 21st. Um, i give you a couple of minutes each. Tell me what advice would you give this President, what should he do, and what advice would you give a new President? I'm not going to start with that one, so <laughs> <laughs> over there. Well, well um, I, I can't really conceive of, of doing that because not being an American citizen, a U.S. citizen, I, I could never, um, I would be disloyal to my country if I served a foreign government. We, we have so, friends. We could get you but, squared uh, away. <laughs> but just for, <laughs> for argument's uh, sake, uh, I think that it's easier to give advice to the next president. Um, my impression, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, is that this president only takes advice he agrees with. So, but the next president may be more open-minded. Um, I would advise the next president to um, hold the Iranians' feet to the fire and to restore the deterrence of the United States, um, both militarily and otherwise, uh, starting from sanctions. Uh, reminding the president that uh, policy is never a, a, a choice between two mutually exclusive options. It's not uh, either fund the IRGC or build bridges. It's a bit like asking uh, a blue-collar worker who just won the $150 billion at the lottery, will you buy a house or will you buy a car? I'll do both and then some. <laughs> Um, so that's that would be my advice. Restore the deterrence using all the tools in the policy box, and don't be afraid of the possibility that the Iranians may kick and scream and threaten to walk away. They still need this agreement more than we ever did. Okay. All right. Bruce? Uh, I guess I'd refer to previous advice and say, sir, don't you remember, don't do stupid stuff? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, at some point you're, you're just sort of so far down a rat hole you don't know how to get out. but. Uh, when you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, I, I think Emmanuel's point is good, is, is sort of separate from the negotiations, is ensure you have sufficient resources devoted to your security requirements to def suitably defend yourself and your allies. Uh, we've been undermining the, the Defense Department with even before sequestration with, with massive defense cuts. Uh, so right now there is a serious question about U.S. capabilities, given those uh, massive cuts, as well as U.S. resolve. When someone says all the options are the, on the table, I don't think people really believe that. Um, you know, on the Asian side, we've been hearing from allies, uh, you know, throughout the region. You know, they're concerned about U.S. resolve and U.S. capabilities. They can see there's no, you know, there is no Asia pivot. It's good, it's a good uh, talking point, but there are no, there are no resources there for it. It's more of a divot. Um, so I think, you know, and, and I presume we're hearing that from our, you know, European and our, our Middle East allies is that there's concern in the direction we're going, there's concern about the lack of capabilities, the lack of resolve, so that, you know, will there be a, a desire or an inclination to do a snapback? I, I don't really think so. I think it would be a lot of, I mean, intel is really difficult. I did it for 20 years. It's really hard to get smoking gun, slam dunk, we don't like that phrase, uh, evidence of, of cheating, it, it takes time. And, uh, you know, when you're premising an agreement on something that, yeah, we'll be able to find it quick enough to impose sanctions, which, as Manuel said, takes time to, to do, 
there's just so many things that, to me, don't add up. So I, I, w I would parenthetically say that if I was in a position of advising both this president and the next one, there's something seriously askew at the Office of Personnel Management. But um, <laughs> that, that aside, uh, I, I would make the case, and I, I think it's uh, I think the point that the, the president uh, is sort of on a foreign policy path where there's not a lot of room for deviation or for disagreement from his advisors uh, currently is, I, th I think, correct. Um, I would only make the point that for a president who prides himself on his foreign policy acumen and his flexibility, he has left remarkably unused uh, the tool that he has at his disposal, which is to use Congress as a bad cop. Uh, you could have hammered out a much more beneficial deal for long-term American strategic interests simply by saying, we are a democracy. I am constrained by my legislative branch. My legislative branch has its own prerogatives. They're insisting I put this and this and this on the table. And this and this and this can be ballistic missiles or terrorism or human rights or, you know, American prisoners who still languish in Iran, whatever it is. Uh, the, uh, it's disingenuous to think that we used all the tools at our disposal and this is the best possible deal that we could have gotten. That's not very good advice, frankly, um, because I, I'm not sure there's a lot of uh, sunlight to sort of to, to penetrate here. But for the next uh, president, I think what you're seeing, and I think you're beginning already to see it in the um, in the primary debates uh, but on both uh, both sides of the aisle, is this sort of emerging theme of we need to mend it or we need to end it, right? I think that's uh, it's elegant in its simplicity, but I think it's more than that. Uh, I, I think we need to. Also, if we have an administration that comes in and really begins to reassert American primacy globally, to have our response to the JCPOA, to the current the nuclear deal, be part of a larger strategy to contain and roll back Iranian adventurism. It can't just be about Iran's nuclear program. Um, several years ago, about uh, 20 years ago, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the senior, then senior senator from New York, wrote a piece on criminal justice, he was a big proponent of criminal justice, uh, about defining deviancy down. Um, and uh, that's germane here because, frankly, we're defining Iran's deviancy down. Our problem with Iran doesn't just extend to the nuclear program. It deals with Iran's radical ideology, its support for terrorism, its attempt to remake the Middle East uh, in its own image. Uh, these are all things that an administration that's fully committed to engagement with the Middle East will have to deal with. It's not just about the nuclear portfolio. And the, the quicker we can get out of that policy cul-de-sac and think about the Iran challenge more broadly, frankly, the better off we'll be. All right. Well, folks, we had a, a pretty rich discussion here this morning. Uh, this is a very, very difficult issue set because it's not just one issue. It's a whole set of them. Uh, it, it is not amenable to simple solutions. Anybody who offers simple solutions to this kind of problem set, you probably don't want to listen to because it, it takes more than a bumper sticker to deal with these kind of problems. Uh, I would ask each of you to take what you've heard this morning, ruminate on it, think about it, and, and come to your own conclusions. Don't, don't just take the headline off, off this morning's paper or some other paper. Uh, that we've got some, some heavy lifting to do in this country to address these problems. But please join me in thanking the panel. And, and we thank you for your kind attention. We're concluded.